Topic 5C, curve fitting to polynomials, as well as interpolation and extrapolation. This lecture builds on the last one and will now describe a curve fitting method that's an exact fit. In other words, the line that we're curve fitting to will pass exactly through all of our sample points. We will then use that to do interpolation and extrapolation. So this part of the lecture, we're going to fit a polynomial to a set of measured data. So what we're showing on this slide is an nth order polynomial. Now notice, even though we call this an nth order polynomial, there's actually n plus one unknowns that we have to solve for. We have a sub n all the way to a one, but then also this extra a naught. So even though it's an nth order polynomial, we need n plus one points in order to calculate all of these coefficients. So that's our problem. Let's determine a naught, a one, a two, all the way up to a one, given some set of sample points. Very similar to before, we are going to write the equation of our polynomial at each of our measured points. So we'll have our position x1, from which we have calculated an f1. This is our measurement, if you will. And these are our measured x values. So each of these equations contain the same a0, a1, a2, and a n, but they have different x and f of x's. And we write this once for every one of our measured points. So notice there is n plus one of those equations. And this can be a very large set of equations. But in this case, we have exactly the same number of equations as we had unknowns. Before, we had more equations than we had unknowns. Now it's exactly the same. Also note, there's no residual terms here. That is because we're doing an exact fit. And so there is no error. So the, really the first step in this process, I should say the second step, since we the first step being writing our equation for our polynomial for each one of our measured points, is to then to put this in matrix form. And notice this first column vector are our measured values of F built into our big square matrix are essentially the coordinates of our measured points. So it's all the different values of X in this case. And then the last column vector are the unknowns that we're solving for. These are the polynomial coefficients, if you will. We can write this a bit more compactly using a matrix notation. And in my notation, I use lowercase letters for column vectors uppercase letters for big square matrices or big rectangular matrices. And I rarely deviate from that, but sometimes I do. Once we've cast these equations in the matrix form, we simply just solve. So the process is quite simple. We have our polynomial. We write it for every single one of our measured points. We cast that in the matrix form. We do a backward divide, LU decomposition, uh, whatever, and we get our unknown coefficients, the A's. So at this point, we have fit our polynomial to our measured points. Let's bring this together through an example. So we have a plot here with three points, and we want to generate a polynomial that passes exactly through all of those three points. So what we see, the arguments inside the f function, those are our measured values of x, and these are our measured values of y, or f, if you will. That's the setup of our problem. Since we only have three points, that means we can only fit this to a second order polynomial. So that's what we'll choose. Three unknowns, we have an a naught, we have an A1 and an A2. So three unknowns, three points, we can do an exact fit. So next, we will write this equation three times, the equation of our polynomial three times, once for each of our sample points. We can then take this set of three equations and put it in matrix form. Well, we actually have numbers to put in for our values of X and our values of F. 
And so we have that over here. And this is a very easy equation to solve for our unknown coefficients, the a0, a1, and a2. So we do that, a backward divide, and we get our coefficients. And so in this case, a0 is 0, a1 is 1.45, and a2 is minus 0.3. That lets us write our polynomial now this way. So a0 was 0, so it doesn't even appear in the equation. And we have an a1 times x plus a2 times x squared. But since a2 is a negative number, we just write that as a negative 0.3. If we plot our original three points plus the line we just calculated for the second order polynomial, we can see that that line passes exactly through all of those points. We've done an exact fit. This is very different to the previous lecture where our samples had noise in them and we just did a best fit. And we did the best fit in the sense of least squares. Now that we can fit a polynomial to a set of data, we're able to come up with an analytical expression that passes through our data points. We can then use this analytical expression to calculate values outside of where those points are, that's extrapolation, or calculate points in between our measured points, and that's called interpolation. Why on earth do we want to do this? Well, it could be that those measurements are very expensive or difficult to make. Imagine it takes you one week of work in the lab to measure one point. And so you spend a month, you only have four points and you would like to know what happens between those. And you could spend many, many more weeks doing experiments, or if you notice that those points are falling along a line or a curve, you could do a curve fit and in just minutes be able to estimate what's happening in between your actual measured data points. So the steps for interpolation and extrapolation are quite easy. This is the first step, fit your data to a curve. Step two, now you have, in a sense, a, a symbolic expression for that curve. Just use that to calculate values inside and outside. Let's talk about linear interpolation. So look at the blue curve for right now. That's the real curve. That's the actual physical thing that would happen and we may not be able to go in and measure that and so we don't know that however we were able to obtain two measurements that fall on that curve so we have one point and two points so we don't know that the curve or the function actually does that so if we fit this let's say to a straight line then our curve fit is this line and if we interpolate what is happening at some intermediate point xi, we might say, oh, that data point falls here. Well, with some a priori knowledge of the actual function, which we know is up here, there is some error. And that's what happens when we interpolate or extrapolate that we introduce error. So certainly the more points we can fit to in the higher order of the polynomial, the less error, but the more computationally intensive it would be. So in this case, we just fit, we have two points, we have the equation for a line, and we can use that to calculate the value of y anywhere between those points, assuming it's a line. So if it's not a line, we have trouble. Let's talk about polynomial interpolation. So almost by definition, in order to fit something to a polynomial, we need at least three points. If we only had two points, we can only really make a line out of that. So first what we'll do is we will derive big ugly expressions for calculating those polynomial coefficients without using matrices. We'll use matrices to get those equations, but then we'll have these big equations for calculating the polynomial coefficients. So we start here with three points and a polynomial, and we'd like to fit that function to three points. So keeping our variable symbolic, we will write our equation for a polynomial for each of our three points, and then put those in matrix form. At this point, we can bring the big matrix containing our x coordinates over to the other side and solve for our polynomial coefficients. 
So when we invert this matrix with the X's, this is what we end up getting. And that's kind of big and ugly. So we can extract our expressions for A0, A1, and A2. And we could type these directly into MATLAB and use that to calculate A0, A1, and A2 without having to go through the matrices. In practice, I think it's much easier to build your numbers into the matrix, do the matrix division, and then just get A0, A1, and A2. But you will see these equations in the literature or in textbooks, and now you know where they came from. But in practice, I would just put the numbers in the matrices, do a backward divide, and you have A0, A1, and A2. So here's an example. Let's do a quadratic interpolation. So this is a second order polynomial. And we have three measured points. Notice these are our same three measured points for our first example. So we've actually already done the curve fit for it. But we don't know the value of f at x equals three. All we know is it's somewhere between these two. So we want to interpolate this. So step one is to do the curve fit. Now we've already done it. Uh, if not, we would have written our polynomial for each of those three measured points, put those in matrix form, backward divided to calculate the polynomial coefficients, and then finally, we're able to write our polynomial. And it's from this that we will do our interpolation and extrapolation. So once we have that, it is trivial to figure out what's happening at x equals three. We just plug in a value of three for X and do our math and we get a value of 1.65. And if we were to plot this, we have in red our three measured points. And then at X equals three, we have our interpolated point. And what we can see is that it also falls exactly on the line. That's an interpolation. We can do the same thing and extrapolate data. So we actually want to guess what the function value is outside of our given range. So we have measured samples here from x equals zero all the way up to x equals four. However, we would like a value from x equals minus 0.5. That is outside of this range, but we can still do it. And it follows the exact same procedure as interpolation. So we do the curve fit. And so behind this is we write that, uh, we write our equation for our polynomial at each of our three points. We put that into matrix form, backward divide, get our polynomial coefficients, and then write our polynomial. So same thing as in the previous example. But now we just plug in a value of x that is outside of our measured range from zero to four, and we get a negative 0.8. So if we plot that, we also see that this falls on top of our blue line. Now, in general, I will add that extrapolating is tends to be less accurate and more guesswork than interpolation. But if you have no other choice, maybe it's impossible to make a measurement at x equals minus 0.5. And so the only thing that we have to do is extrapolate. 